Hey, Ed, come check out my North Star Christmas tree topper at Levitate's. Is this a gummy bear? Yeah, we lost baby Jesus. Hey, check out these LED lights. I have them synced up to a 76 hour all Christmas music playlist. There's my little Christmas DJ. <laughs> Ow. So, are you waiting till Christmas is over so you can go buy a new nativity set when they're on sale? Huh? No, no, oh no. We lost baby Jesus like 11 years ago. Is, is baby Jesus always a gummy bear? Oh, uh -huh. no, oh, we trade it out every year. Yeah, like uh, last year it was a uh, tiny troll doll. And the year before that, we used a uh, dog treat. They were the perfect size, but <laughs> Dalton kept taking them and eating them. You, you mean your dog kept stealing them? No, my son Dalton, he loves those dog treats. Especially the peanut butter ones. There was one year that we used a, uh, a doll head. That was creepy. We, we made a modeling clay, baby Jesus. The dog took that one, too. Um, one year, we got desperate and used an ice cube. That was a mess and a mess. Yeah, just seems like everything we try to replace baby <laughs> Jesus with never lasts. Say that again. Everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never seems to last. And? And what? Say it again, slowly. Why? Just do it, dulcimo, slowly, do it. I don't understand what's happening. Just do it. This is getting weird. Say it! Fine, but when I'm done saying this, you're gonna march in here and you're gonna watch my star levitate. Fine, 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 fine. fine. Do it. Fine. Everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never seems to, oh, yep, there it is. Okay, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hi, Rock Church Lexa, how we doing? My name's Pastor Mike, and uh, we're so glad you guys are here. If you're a first-time guest or a second-time guest, do us a favor. In the seat back in front of you, there's something called Connection Card. If you would fill that out, if you feel comfortable, take it to the Welcome Center. We have some information for you about the church. May answer some of your questions. And if you're watching this on YouTube and on Facebook, thank you so much for, for watching us there. So we are in a series called Christmas in action and what we've been doing is we're talking about you know how can we possibly in this christmas season how can we avoid getting caught up in all the goings on and and all the things that are going they're happening and as a result really lose our focus on what christmas is truly all about and so as we talk as we talk about christmas then we also need to find out what is it that we learn about christmas that we can put into action that's what we're talking about. Pastor David kicked us off last week, and he spoke from 1 John chapter 4. And he shared the fact that our biggest gift given to us was by God. It was given us Jesus Christ, and it was about love. And so he also talked about very practical ways that we can take that love and share that all year round, but even so at Christmas. Now, if you missed Pastor David's message, or you'd like to catch up on any others, go to hrclex.life. That's our website. Go to the sermon engine, and you can pick it up from there. So I want to talk today about this busy season we have. Maybe you've seen this. Uh, this is, um, I saw this on Amazon. This is an upside-down Christmas tree. And when I checked last week, it was for sale for $129.99. And last night it was down to $89.99 with the guarantee that it will be delivered by Christmas. And so you think about this trend, and by the way, I think it's upside down. You see all the adult beverages on the corner there? I think that's why it's upside down. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> so think about what are the advantages of having a tree upside down? Okay, so as you look at the tree, you're more at eye level where the majority of the ornaments are, right? That's one. The other might be that you have more room at the bottom to put gifts, right, and decorations. It could be, that could be the way, right? So the advantage is, now needless to say, it's quite the conversation piece. Anybody ever do one of those upside down trees? No? 
So in, in, in this Amazon's not the only company offering them. As a matter of fact, I saw a couple. One of them was four hundred and eleven dollars to get this this tree. And I was doing some doing some research for this message, and I wanted to know what maybe some of the psychologists would say about Christmas, about what we go through and all the, the hecticness and the spending the money. And I found one named Patricia Dalton, and she said that most people really don't need an upside down tree for Christmas to be turned upside down in their life. And she, she pointed out that the, the rapid c consumerism that we now have used to be, it's Christmas, right? But now it's all year long, and it's exasperated, of course, during Christmas, you know, Black Friday and all that. So it's really become a year-round affliction. And what she observes in her, in her practice is that there are people who are, are unhappy as they're trying to fulfill all that they think that they're obligated to do around Christmas. The gifts, the parties, the planning, the food, all, the, all that. And what happens is they get unhappy because they, that can lead to irresponsible spending, and if you do that, then what's going to happen is, is you're going to be depressed. It's not going to be a good Christmas, and you're going to be in a bad mood to start out. And you talk about all the stuff you buy. Uh, she quoted back, if you were alive in the 60s, and Dave Ramsey would say the same thing, think about all of the, uh, he'd forgotten the fact that, that when we buy these things, they start to own us. And it's, it doesn't let up in Christmas. So, but what happens is to pay for all the spending, is, is people have to work harder sometimes, take extra shifts, work harder, work longer, because what's happening is it can, maybe it's happened to you, it can affect your family, it can affect your marriage, it also can affect your, your health. So I, if you think about all that we've been through, and you've probably been through it too, there's really no, it's really no surprise that by the end of this season, you know, maybe the night after Christmas, we are spiritually drained. And so left unchecked, the American Christmas can be upside down. That's why I used the tree. For, you know, purchases can leave months of extra debt to pay off, hectic schedules. You don't spend time for your family. You spend time where you should, and you don't, you lose track. We lose track of what is important. And these blinders that we experience with consumerism is if we're not careful, we will be blind to the true meaning of Christmas. I'll give you an idea, just some more statistics. Americans spend over $109 billion at Christmas time. Now, by the way, there's 200 plus countries in the world. The $109 billion that we spend as Americans on Christmas alone is higher than the gross national product of 129 other countries. You know, you think about upside down trees. If you have a car, maybe you've experienced this, and you may owe more on the car than it's really worth, you know, car people call that what? An upside down car. Well, if we're not careful and we struggle with all this debt, we are ourselves and our lifestyle is going to be upside down. The true meaning of Christmas, I know you hear this in almost every Christmas season, is totally lost. So my question to all of us is, would, wouldn't it be nice to trade our used car upside down Christmas for something better? You know, how can we avoid not getting lost in all, the, all that's going on because the re re repercussions of missing Christmas go far beyond just a month or a week. What it does is it, it really, in the decorations and the food. So what I want to do, I want to share a story we can learn from today, and it's about the city or the town of Nazareth. Now, this is, of course, Jesus' hometown. And I want to talk about how Nazareth missed Christmas. And what can we learn from that as we talk about putting Christmas in action? So, actually, I was thinking about this. The tree, I was doing some research on Christmas trees, and the upside-down tree really was not a modern invention. Actually, in the 12th century, you may have known this, that houses of Christians used to take fir trees that were shaped like a triangle, hang them upside down, and this would represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was called a Trinity tree. But I don't think it ever occurred to our friend, our, our, pre, our ancestors that were, you know, 900 years ago to cover it with all the presents like we do now. 
So back to Nazareth. This is where it all started. This is where Mary, as you know the story, heard from the angels about what God had in store for her and the greatest gift that mankind has ever experienced. We'll, be in the, we'll start out in the book of Luke. Luke is the uh, third book in the New Testament. We'll be in chapter 1. And uh, so chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to be to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And so if you think about this, I think that Christmas all of a sudden found Mary, right? And then Mary found Christmas. And it's not just the angel of the Lord found her. What's critically important is her life changed because she was willing to be found. Now, later in that same chapter, in verse 38, uh, Mary says that I am the Lord's servant. And for the rest of her life, what happened was was God was fulfilling her life in with the details of the plans he had for her. So back here in, in, back there in Nazareth for a season, Mary for a while was the only person to believe that his miracle was going to occur. Matter of fact, it even took a miraculous visit from an angel for Joseph to understand what was happening. So the angel, you know the story, the angel appeared to Joseph and told Joseph not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. That the, and also that the baby it was conceived by the Holy Spirit. You can read this in uh, verses 18 to 24. Now, eventually, Mary had to spend most of her pregnancy away from her hometown, uh, visit with relatives, uh, also the shame that she was feeling. And so she had, and from her friends and even her family. Now, the lesson for us today is more important than we might think. Yes, we would like to reclaim the rest of this holiday, right? Yes, we'd like to remember the real reason for the celebration. And yes, we'd like to spend less money on gifts and realize what an incredible gift God has given us. But if we miss the meaning of this season of faith, we also may miss the opportunity of what Jesus can do in our life, the rest of our life. This happened that way in Nazareth. When Jesus was going around the cities and the towns and the villages and preaching the, what became the God, what was going to be the gospel, is it was accepted almost everywhere. However, when he went to his hometown, he went back there, 30 years later from the time he was born, he was invited to preach in the synagogue. Okay, but what's interesting was he delivered, Jesus delivered the same message he's been delivering to all the villages, but it wasn't accepted in Nazareth. They refused to believe. And so let's go to Mark. Mark is one book before Luke. Mark is the second book in the New Testament. We'll be in chapter six. Uh, and those listening, they were invited to the synagogue, the people that were in the town of Nazareth. And, but they were, they were if you read the, the, if you read the uh, story, they were, they were astonished at, the, the, at what he was saying. And so isn't he the son of a carpenter whose mother is Mary? How can he say these things? And so the people were actually offended. So in Mark chapter 6, 4 to 6, verse 4, But Jesus said to them, this is the people in Nazareth, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his relatives, and in his own house. Now, he could do no mighty work there except that he did lay his hands on a few of the sick people and healed them. Verse 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit, and he was teaching. So think about it. What a stunning what a stunning statement that Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. Now, if Jesus had asked his mother, you know, she knew what Nazareth was like for all those, excuse me, for all those years, and she would say that Nazareth has been nursing this, this unbelief, this unfaithfulness for 30 years. So Nazareth had not ever heard from one, but from two of their upstanding young people, Mary and Joseph, about the miracle that was going to happen, but yet they did not believe it. They did not embrace the miracle that was about to happen. See, they were far too familiar with Joseph and Mary to believe that God would choose them to do what he did. So Grant, it was a stretch for a lot of the people and for his family to understand why Mary was, was so excited about what was going to happen and then Joseph came along. 
See, Nazareth had, they had access, when Jesus was in the synagogue, they had access to the scriptures at the time. So they were familiar, they should have been familiar with Isaiah 7, verse 14, which says that a virgin would be with child. And it's also recorded now in, in Matthew that many of the prophets of the Old Testament said that he would be called a Nazarene. So even so, for their native son, a woman um, who was born of a woman who insisted the pregnancy was a miracle, they refused to believe. They were the first to really miss Christmas. They were simply too familiar with Jesus to believe that he was the chosen one, that he was the Messiah. You know, I can relate to this. Um, people that have known me for my life, when they find out that I'm a pastor, they don't believe it. <laughs> they don't believe it. As a matter of fact, six years ago, we had our 50th high school reunion, and people are still asking me if I'm really a pastor. So I know what he was feeling like, right? So through the miracles that were already happening in other places, the city, the village of Nazareth was still faithful. They did not have faith at all. Now think about this. What, what little bit of faith, a small amount of faith, the impact this could have had on the people in that city. So what's the impact of this story to us today? You know, most of us are as familiar with Jesus, haven't heard the stories. If you've uh, been in church for a long time, we know the songs, we, you know, we've sung the song, we know the story, we know the, the, we memorize the scripture. But really what's happening is as the years have gone on, there seems to be a, a huge gulf between faith and trust, and we need to build a bridge. So this Christmas, would, would Jesus be amazed at our faith, or would he be amazed at our lack of faith? Keep that thought in mind. So would it be yet another Christmas filled with too much stuff and too much food and too many expenses? I see some heads nodding already. You know, could this be the, could this be the season when we really realize that God has plans for us and only because Jesus was born? Friends, here's what I'm saying. This is the right time for the right message. So what's the right time? I say the right time is Christmas. Think about it. What better opportunity do we have? We're giving gifts to share the gift of Jesus Christ. So what's the right message? You know, most of, most of our culture seems to miss this season because of the frantic giving and for the parties and overdoing it. But the real reason, and I hate this cliche, but the reason for the season is Jesus. Emmanuel, as we sung in the song, Jesus, God is with us. So there's a, there's a sense in telling, there's a sense that telling the world about Jesus might be easier than Christmas. I really believe it is. Maybe you've already experienced that. I heard a story, uh, I've seen this several times over the years, about a woman who was doing her shopping. She went to a mall. And she's looking for a gift that's already gone away. It's all been sold out. The, the aisles are crowded. There, but she's got all these presents with her and these boxes and, and, and bags. And she goes into the, she needs to go upstairs. She can't find what she wants. So she, the elevator, the door opened, and it's packed with people with the same thing. They got stuff. And they grudgingly move back to give her a little bit of a space to get in. And so as the door closed, the story says, she blurted out, Whoever is responsible for this whole Christmas thing ought to be arrested, strung up, and shot. And then a few other people that were there, you know, they nodded their head in agreement. Then somewhere in the back of the elevator, they heard a little single voice that said, Don't worry, they already crucified him. Very telling, right? True story. So I'm talking today about simplifying Christmas. It's about spending less, doing less, and as a result, enjoying Christmas even more. And here's a little tidbit. I was looking around for the shopping habits. Uh, women, you know, this, you know what I'm about to say. Talk about men and shopping. You know, particularly at Christmas because it's so crowded. But I found a survey, a 2013 survey, and it talked about information that all you busy women already know. Apparently, men dread the holiday that so much that they'll do anything. I saw another survey that said men would rather watch their favorite team lose over and over again than have to go shopping. So I'm guessing it's no surprise to those watching and those listening. So this survey found that 80% of men didn't enjoy going shopping. 
I see people laughing, with their partners. And it also found that on average, the man would last only 26 minutes shopping. He was done, he was bored, he was gone. But women, you women are stronger and you would last two hours. Maybe some of you can even last even more. And I think the women get mad because the men give up. They go sit on the park bench with other men who've given up and they're eating a cinnamon roll from Cinnabon. I don't know. That may be, may be what they're saying. And, and 45% of the men avoid, of the men avoid, avoided shopping at all costs. And guys, think about it. This is why Amazon was created, right? And guess, <laughs> guess who created Amazon? A man. There you go, guys, right? So almost half, if it's, this article said, almost half of spousal arguments became while shopping because men became very frustrated. They had already bought what they want. They want to go home, but the, wife, the woman was still shopping. All right, so here's, here's a question. How can we share the right message about Christmas right now, right now in the Christmas season? How can we truly have Christmas in action? You know, our, our, if, here's a couple suggestions. And Pastor David last week gave some other ones, and I'm sure we'll hear some more next week. So how about trying this? Our family and friends might be, they may, they may stand up and take notice if we just sat down and wasn't so hectic. My daughter and granddaughter would always plan this Good Friday visit, and they're up like at 4 o'clock, and they're putting what they want to do. But can you imagine our family, if we do that, can you imagine what our families might think if all of a sudden we, we slow down and just take a rest? Or how about this? How about we intentionally schedule a time of personal worship and reflection? You know, if we haven't done that before during the season, that might draw attention, right? How about this? How about we make it a family tradition to give at least one gift to a mission or to a, 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 to, to a charity. As a matter of fact, Nancy and I do this every, every year. And for my adult friends and relatives, uh, they're, they're used now to the fact that we find one of their charities they like and we make the donation in their name. I mean, we didn't think of that. It's just a great, great thing to do. So upon reflection, it may never be easier than at Christmas to share the message, the message of Christ. Have you thought about that? You know, we tend to do it around Easter a lot, and then, and then Christmas gets all caught up in all the activity. So it's the right time for the right message. And also, this is the right place for the right message. You know, Nazareth didn't see itself in the history in the right place for the, for the home of the Messiah. You know, the village didn't have the best reputation. You may remember when, uh, when Jesus was choosing uh, the disciples, uh, one of them was, was Philip, and Philip saw what was happening, that Jesus was, was, was now here. They believed it. And so what Philip did was his buddy Nathaniel, he went to talk to him and said, hey, guess what? We know the Messiah is here. And here's what Nathaniel said. And after saying this, he still was chosen to be <laughs> to be a disciple. John 1, 46. And Nathanael said to him, this is to Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So think about that. And if you read the prophecies, the, apostle, the uh, uh, prophet Isaiah had promised the Messiah would be despised, even contemptible. So, you know, think about this. Little Nazareth, and I can't believe someone like this came from their hometown. You know, there's a lot of history about famous people and entertainers coming from, from little towns. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure it's on the map anymore, but Knob Creek, Kentucky. Guess who was born there? Abraham Lincoln. And in, in Plains, Georgia, there's 611 people. And that's where President Jimmy Carter came from. Maybe like John Wayne from the movies, uh, he was born in a, a town of 4,800 people called Winterset, Iowa. You know, Tiger Woods, if you're a golfer, Tiger Woods was born in Cypress, California. It was a little bit bigger, 40-some thousand people. President George Bush was born in New Haven, Connecticut. And there's 124,000 people there. But on the other side, you've got Michael Jordan, who was born as a skinny little boy in Brooklyn, New York, which had 2.4 million people. So any place, any time can produce a great leader, an unforgettable entertainer. 
But this place, our place, happens to be the right place for the right message. So who's really going to bring the good news to your family or to your circle of friends? Think about it. You're in the bed. We're in the Now, the, some people don't want to hear it, but we have to take that risk. You know, at some point, it's, it's better to realize that uh, we're the best person to speak to someone in our family. However, in my case, years ago, I found it harder to give the gospel to my immediate family than I do to strangers at Walmart. I see some heads nodding. I was talking to Pastor Andy this week, and he was talking about taking Corbin to, to school. And, and Andy wasn't peppering him with questions, but he was talking about the Christmas story. And, and he was amazed, Andy was amazed, of course he's a pastor's son, but how much Corbin has picked up, you know, through the teaching of the family, but also through, through our high right kids. So I don't think it's probably anyone else's opportunity to come talk to my family. I think it's me, or even to my friends. You know, we need to find a way to get the message in our area of influence this year. Maybe in our celebrations, and definitely include prayer, not only when we eat, but also just thanks for the bounty, thanks for the, the gifts we have, thanks for the friends, thanks for everything, right? Or maybe it could be an outreach. You could be a part of an outreach. You know, at High Rock Church Lexington, we value our outreach. You know, we really, one of our missions is to be as, as giving as possible to, uh, you know, to the less fortunate, to those in need. You know, some of you have helped this time. Uh, Pastor David mentioned this in the, in the announcements. You know, we began the Thanksgiving and Christmas season around Thanksgiving. And you guys who contributed, you were able to provide entire, God, we call it a gobbler box, an entire meal for 25 families. And how about this? Uh, our Christmas outreach provided for over 60 people in the community. And these are funded by you. And what we do, those who helped here, what you're doing, you're, you're doing exactly what Pastor David talked about. We are sharing the love that God has shown us by caring for other people. So maybe this, maybe, you know, if you get through all this hullabaloo and, 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 and Christmas is done and you're up, like David said, at 4 o'clock, opening packets, opening presents, and then you're tired and you sit there in the afternoon. You know, instead of talking about the holiday football games, you know, how about this? It's my last point. You are the right person for the right message. And this is you as in all of us. We are the right people for this message. Now, some people I talk to, they, they get a little shy. I know I was at first about sharing the message of the gospel and even sharing the... So, so you, might have an, you, might, you might be able to share like the prophets. <laughs> Maybe you're that good. Maybe you struggle a little bit. Well, here's an opportunity. We have a Christmas Eve Eve service. That's our Christmas service. It's going to be on Friday the 23rd. If maybe you're a little shy or you don't want to share it to your family, invite them to come to the church to our, our celebration because we always, every service we have, we clearly give a gospel, December 23rd. So each of us is gifted by God in our own ways with our own skills. We've been gifted by God to deliver the good news. So why should we miss this opportunity? It's such a goal, it's just out there for us. Now Mary and Joseph, they paid a big price of, of reputation and, and they spent time being scorned early on and they had to travel to go sign up for the census. So they went through a lot, but the rest of Nazareth who didn't accept this, they, were, they, endured, they didn't endure any discomfort because they didn't believe the good news. So what we do with the right message, given the right time, at the right place is, is up to each one of us. Each one of us has a different, different style. So what we're sharing, friends, is a life-changing faith, a Christmas-finding faith, the kind of faith that leads us to take action, not just enjoy the holiday. So let's make Christmas this year a day of action and, you know, maybe the decision belongs to us. We, we, got, that, we got that journey of faith that Mary and Joseph took. So let's go ahead and share that message whenever we can, however we can, during the next two weeks and after. You remember the angels said, maybe you may think it's impossible. Remember what the angels told Mary? Nothing is impossible 
with God. So the, we're the right place, the right time, and the, we're the right per- people. And most importantly, we have the right message. So what is this message? You know, we, we, it, it seems, for some people, it may seem easier to talk about what Jesus did for us on the cross around Easter as you build up to that. And maybe, maybe some of us don't spend as much time talking about the, the, the beauty of what Jesus did by being born. So why was Jesus born? This might answer some of your questions. Jesus had to be born because of mankind's sin. Jesus had to be born because God wanted to reveal his own character to us, to humanity. Otherwise, we wouldn't know God's characteristics. Jesus had to be born to remove the sins of humankind through a perfect sacrifice. I think that's beautiful. So we tend to talk about the gospel, the good news. We, we do it every week in every message that we have here. But and I don't want to say you're, we're all that way, but sometimes we, we tend to do more of it around Easter. But what a great opportunity to talk, particularly to those skeptics in your family. And so what is the message? What is the, the message? The message is, as I said, we are born in sin, all because of the original sin. You read it in chapter 3 in Genesis. Because of what Adam and Eve did, we are all born, every one of us and everyone watching, everyone who will be born after us until the end of time is born in sin. And Jesus came. He was born because of our sin. He was born to reveal that Jesus and God could take away that sin. And he was born to remove human, he, he was born to, to prove he's a perfect sacrifice. So what did he do? Okay, Jesus was born, prophecies, he fulfilled the prophecies, 30 years of, of preaching. And at the end of this, the plan from God was to make us all better, to, to let us lose the sin. And it, I find it amazing that in knowing my life for all the last 75 years, all the sin and all the, all the things I've done, but right now, God doesn't see those. He sees me as perfect. I'm not perfect, and I won't be until we're in heaven. But that's the offer that we have. I mean, what a great gift to share. You may get by Xboxes 5 and all that, but what better gift to share? As a matter of fact, Michelle Evans came up to me after last service and asked a few questions for her, uh, I guess her relative, Chloe, little Chloe. I guess she's a, I don't know what she's a cousin or a niece. And, and she was starting to ask questions. You know, just like Andy did with Corbin. And what a perfect opportunity to do that, to share the message. It doesn't have to be over. We don't have to describe what Jesus looked like on the cross. We don't need to do that. We just need to say, show the fact that what Jesus did do for us willingly on the cross. So it's, we are the right people. We are the right time is Easter, excuse me, it's Christmas. And we have the right message. It's as simple as that. I'd like to pray us out. Can you pray with me? Father God, we, we come to you, Lord. We come to you so appreciative of the incredible gift that you've given us. Lord, there's no way that we could be reconciled because of our lifestyle, because of what we've done, without Jesus giving his life up willingly for us. What an incredible gift. I mean, it is the greatest gift ever. But, Lord, we need to understand that we shouldn't keep this great gift to ourselves. We should share it. We are called to make disciples. That's what we're trying to do here, Lord, at this church. And we just pray that that through the messages and through the Bible studies and through the connect groups and, and through the outreach, everything that we do, that we truly understand that it's for one reason. We are showing the love of Jesus Christ. And for, for those who don't know what Jesus did, I, I mentioned the cross, and uh, we, we need to believe that Jesus is God's son. As I said, he was sent here to rectify us, to take away our sins. When Jesus did that, if we give them to him, Jesus put him on his own back, took him to the cross, gave up his life willingly. But the deal was sealed when three days later he walked out of the grave proven he is who he said he was, who the prophecy said he was. His name is Jesus Christ. He walked out of the tomb three days later. The only leader of any religion that is still alive. So Lord, we love you. 
and just thank you. We, we just, I just pray that, that as a church and as families, that we, are, that we do share the message with all of our family and our, city, and our, our circle of influence. So, Lord, we love you, and thank you again for the incredible gift of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.